Hello, this presentation is about how to write thesis proposals. Sometimes it can seem like a daunting task, but if you take it one step at a time, you can produce a great thesis proposal too. Let's, today we're going to talk about what a thesis proposal is and why you're asked to do one. The functions and benefits of a thorough thesis proposal, six required components of proposals, six things faculty would expect to see in a proposal, what a proposal actually looks like, what's included in the first three chapters approach of a thesis proposal, and some tips about style and resources that are available to you. So what is a thesis proposal? Quite simply, a thesis proposal is a document that proposes a research project. But why are you asked to do a thesis? And why are you asked to do a thesis proposal? Well, you don't achieve mastery of a body of knowledge simply by knowing stuff. Young scholars are expected to make original contributions to the body of knowledge, and a thesis proposal is your plan to achieve that contribution. There's two big essential functions of a proposal. Your proposal, you're trying to gain agreement with your committee about a thesis project, so your proposal needs to demonstrate value argue that the question you're approaching is worth asking. And also, your proposal needs to demonstrate that your project is doable, that it can be accomplished. And to achieve these essential functions, there's going to be six elements that a faculty member or committee members would expect to see in a proposal. But before we get to those six required components, let's think about how do you benefit by writing a good proposal. You benefit from writing a good proposal because it really lays the groundwork for a contract between you and your committee. If your committee agrees that your proposed project has value and that it's doable, then you can carry on and get it done. You Also, by writing a proposal, you're giving yourself direction instructions to keep your efforts pointed towards the goal, as opposed to chasing down tangents where your time may not be most effective. So once you have a good working contract with your committee, they've said your question's worth doing and your approach is proper, then, then you can always argue that, well, this is what we agreed to. So it's a good thing to have a well-defined proposal. And six elements that would be in a good proposal include a statement of your research question, the rationale and justification for doing the project, a review of literature, an explanation of your theoretical or conceptual framework that you're using to approach your study, the methodology, that path you're going to take to answer your questions, and also research design and a timeline. Let's take each of those in turn. Stating the research question. Now, technically, you might state a problem, a question, or a hypothesis. Questions and hypotheses are what are typically associated with a research thesis. Questions are appropriate when the pre-existing literature does not indicate what the results are. It is perfectly appropriate to approach a research project with a question. Hypotheses are appropriate when the previous literature predicts what the answer or the outcome of your research study might be. So even when hypotheses are appropriate, they are typically preceded by some overarching question, the big driving question that's, that's behind the whole project. Many theses have questions as opposed to hypotheses, and it's perfectly appropriate if you have both questions and hypotheses associated with your research study. So, but why are you even trying to articulate this question slash problem slash hypotheses? Well, clearly defining the question or the problem provides guidance for the entire project. It articulates the inspiration for the effort, and again, it prevents misdirected effort. If you have a well-defined question or problem you're approaching, you won't waste time trying to answer questions that aren't related to your specific idea. Stating that question problem hypothesis is, is defining the scope of what your project will address. What about the rationale and justification for your study? Well, what this does is argue that your question you're asking is worth answering. It explains why the topic is important. Is previous literature lacking? Is there missing literature or missing aspects in the existing literature? Or is the literature dated? These are all reasons that would justify a research uh, study. 
Will the findings have application and or intellectual merit? Will what you find be useful in today's world or will it help provide possibilities for further research? These are all ways in which you can provide justification for your research project. The literature review. The literature review is an incredibly important part of any research or any study. And among the things that a literature review accomplishes is it demonstrates the researcher's familiarity with previous findings. It communicates what has been done on a topic and by whom, and perhaps more importantly, the review of literature can highlight what has not been addressed in the previous literature. Reviews of literature provide justification for many parts of your thesis, including justifying the question, but also explaining and justifying your theoretical conceptual approach, your method, and other aspects of your thesis. The literature review may end up being a very, very important part of your final thesis, and don't just wing one based on the instructions here. Realize that you can find whole books on how to do a literature review. Conducting secondary research prior to primary research is a very important part of our whole scientific method. What about the theoretical and conceptual framework? Well, all of the problems, everything in our lives, we're approaching through some perceptual lenses. The theoretical framework defines that viewpoint or angle of your inquiry. Let's people know where you stand and how you're approaching the problem. The theoretical framework will bring with it some assumptions, but also that theoretical framework is what enables your approach to be able to answer the question of your research study. The fifth element that would be included in a proposal is the methodology. Now the methodology defines the path or techniques that you will use to answer your question, to address your problem, or to test your hypotheses. It might be qualitative or quantitative or a mixture of the both. In the methodology section of the proposal, your committee will expect to see your materials and tools, such as the coding sheet or an interview schedule. The methodology proposal section should clearly identify your sample, what it is you're going to be examining. The method section specifically argues that the methods proposed will, in fact, answer the question. And in this section, you should provide both the strengths and weaknesses of your decisions regarding methodology. The sixth element, as one would expect in a proposal, is the research design timeline. Now, while this part will not be of the six elements we've discussed so far, five of them will end up in your final thesis document, but this this section doesn't end up in your final thesis document. However, it's critical that you provide a timeline to convince your committee that the project is doable, that you can, in fact, accomplish the project on time, that you argue that you have the facilities, the funding, the ability, the permission, whatever necessary to get that project completed, And also in your research design timeline, you'll provide contingency plans for predictable pitfalls that might occur during the research process. So altogether, the six required areas of content include the statement of your research question, the rationale justification of your project, a review of existing literature, an explanation of your theoretical conceptual framework, the methodology, and your research design and timeline. So with all that said, okay, we've got these six things we're going to put in there, and each of these six things accomplish something towards your proposal. What does an actual proposal look like? Well, this can be very variable. Different units and different professors do it different ways. Personally, I really like the first three chapters approach, which means that your thesis proposal will constitute the first three chapters of your actual final thesis document. The advantages of doing a very complete proposal of the first three chapters includes it saves work later. It clearly solidifies that agreement between the student and the committee about the nature of the research study and its scope and when it should end. It reduces the likelihood that the proposal defense would be followed by big revisions. Instead, a good three-chapter proposal that everyone agrees on can be followed immediately by the execution of the research activities, not lingering rewriting or delayed planning. 
Typically, after you do the first three chapters, there's only two more chapters to go. Some disadvantages of the three-chapter approach is it's a large investment in the proposal. There's always the possibility that the committee won't agree with you that the project has value and that it's feasible. Another disadvantage I put is it requires intense communication and agreement with your committee chair prior to that formal defense of the proposal itself. Um, I put it as a disadvantage, but it's also an advantage. If you're on key and in agreement with your chair, it's likely that you're on the right path towards completing a final thesis project. The first three chapters are typically Chapter 1, An Introduction, Chapter 2, Review of Literature, and Chapter 3, Methodology. And a typical outline would be that Chapters 4 and 5 are Findings and Discussions. But of course that is flexible as well, but it's a pretty, pretty typical kind of arrangement. So, what would you put in an introductory chapter to a thesis proposal? Well, you would put the background of the problem, stating the problem, purpose of the study, what the theoretical framework would be, your research questions or hypotheses, or at least a preview of the overarching definition of the scope of the problem. You would explain briefly the importance of the problem, the scope of the study, define terms that may be relevant to your study, and a summary. One of the things one should keep in mind is that people do not read theses and dissertations sequentially, that they jump around a lot. Um, so in academic writing, we expect uh, chapters to be self-contained and an ability to navigate from chapter four back to chapter one. So uh, there will be repetition. Research questions, for example, will be repeated. The theoretical framework will be addressed again after the introductory chapter, and that's fine do go look at model examples of thesis and dissertations to get a good grasp of what one looks like. The second chapter, that review of lit, can be, again, very flexible and, and depending on the nature of your problem and what you're addressing may contain different things. But here, in general, is what a review of literature should accomplish. Again, realize that there are whole books out there on just how to conduct reviews of literature and also, if you find Communication Yearbook, you'll realize that all it publishes is reviews of literature because understanding what previous researchers have done already is a critical part of our whole scientific method. And what your review of literature chapter should accomplish is it should examine the pre-existing literature which has perspectives or otherwise contributes towards your question or problem of your study. The review of literature provides context for your proposed study. And really importantly, it tests your research question against what is already known. A review of literature will reveal what is missing or lacking in the existing body of knowledge. The review of literature provides additional justifications for your problem, your approach, and your methodology. And your exact questions and hypotheses may end up being placed in this chapter. While you overviewed them in the introduction, this might be where you really explicate the different parts of the exact things your thesis will answer. The methodology section, which may be quantitative, typically would include your research design, your participants or your sample, your instrumentation, your research procedures and pilot testing information, how you're going to analyze the data, so all the regular things you would expect to see there. But also the methodology section is going to include the assumptions of your study and the limitations of your study and a summary for the methodology chapter. And these are the typical components that show up in a quantitative methodology chapter. A qualitative methodology chapter will be similar, achieve the similar functions, but may have some different components, including discussion of the qualitative paradigm, what qualitative methods you'll be using, the researcher's role, where data comes from, how it's collected, how it'll be analyzed and verified, ethical considerations of how that qualitative research was conducted, and a plan for the narrative or the pilot study results. So the first three chapters would be the introduction, the review of literature, and the methodology. To save yourself lots of work later, if you're going to do a nice, well-developed three-chapter thesis proposal, go ahead and do it in the style that would be required of you from the get-go. 
The APA publication manual is very important. In our department, we require that everything academic writing-wise follow the style of the American Psychological Association. This text really defines all sorts of things, such as what your subhead looks like and how you write your running head and how tables look and the order of different components. And so let's do it right from the very beginning and then you will not have to do a lot of revisions and, and, and style corrections later on in the process. Also, the graduate school will impose certain uh, restrictions on what the final document must look like. You can go to their website and see what they require for the electronic dissertation and thesis submission. And also know that the Institutional Review Board, uh, of course, we've got to consider that if we're using human participants in our research, but they also might have specific um, guidelines about how um, information regarding um, findings involving humans can be reported. So be, be sure that you're just following those style guidelines from the very beginning. It'll save you a lot of work later. There are lots of resources out there available for you to help you along the way. If you go to Amazon.com and type in dissertation and thesis writing, it will give you lots of books. People have provided advice. One of them that sounds like silly thing, writing a dissertation for dummies, is actually very good advice. It's a great way to, to save yourself effort and, and feel confident about your approach to your thesis. But also there's some other uh, resources here that I've given you. There's one from UNC Writing Center, which is specifically about advice of approaching a dissertation. Uh, there's one on how to organize your thesis, 30 tips for the writer. Purdue's Online Writing Lab is an excellent resource that's often used by myself and other professors in this unit. It's a great place to look up specific things and it even provides APA style advice, as does APA itself. There's an online tutorial to give you an overview of what American Psychological Association style is all about. I found one site that provided three actual proposal samples and very importantly is the ProQuest Dissertation and Thesis Database. This is available through KSU Library and basically every thesis and dissertation out there, including yours one day, will end up in this database. So if you want to find samples and as part of your secondary review of Lit, this is a very important resource. So that's my advice for writing thesis proposals and I hope you found this useful.